started. Um, so welcome, this is the Equal Pay panel, CLE panel of the CLE and the series of the ABA this year. Um, as I said, I'm Jessica Stender and I'm an attorney at Equal Rights Advocates here in San Francisco. I'm gonna just briefly introduce my fellow panelists. Um, their esteemed uh, biographies are in the bios that were in the materials that, that you received and are too long for me to uh, go into today. So first we have Fred Alvarez from the Coblins firm, um, Jessica James from Oric, and then Lori Andrews from Or Andrews Anderson. I'm really excited to have you all here today. So um, we have been focusing on equal pay in the Rights of Women Committee and broadly in the section for civil rights and social justice. We all know that equal pay is an issue and so we always start off these types of panels with just a quick overview of the fact that nearly 55 years after the Federal Equal Pay Act was enacted, women continue to earn less than men in virtually every industry and occupation in this country. Uh, nationwide, overall, women, full-time working women, earn about 80 cents to every dollar earned by men, and we know that that wage gap is much worse for women of color. So uh, nationwide, African-American women earn about 63 cents to every dollar earned by their white, male, non-Hispanic counterparts. Uh, Latinas make only about 54 cents to the dollar, um, and, and, and the gap is much starker for these, uh, for these individuals who face intersectional forms of discrimination. Um, one quick thing, is the sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are various contributors to that overall gender wage gap, um, intentional discrimination, unconscious bias, a lack of sufficient workplace policies that allow people to take caregiving leave, which is now still more often taken by women, um, occupational segregation, whereby women and people of color are often segregated or funneled into uh, lower paid occupations or industries. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about something a little bit different, and we'll talk more about this difference in the panel, um, which is when a man and women are being paid different amounts of money for equal or substantially similar work, but wanted to give that kind of broad framework to begin with. Um, about the gender wage gap. Um, and we'll talk about some, as you know, litigation trends, legislative trends, and then specific considerations around uh, settlement of these cases. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jessica James, who's gonna start us off uh, discussing some of the litigation trends. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Equal, right, Equal Rights Advocates for inviting me here today to speak on this. I think one of the best parts about my job is being a part of this conversation. I am a senior associate at Oric Carrington and Sutcliffe, and we generally represent employers um, in a wide variety of employment actions, um, including Title VII discrimination claims and claims under the federal and California equal pay laws. Apart from that, I am also a member of the California Pay Equity Task Force, which was commissioned by Governor Brown in 2016 following enactment of the Fair Pay Act. And for anyone that's not familiar with that, um, I would like to put the plug in for materials that we released early this year to coincide with Equal Pay Day. Uh, for the past three years, it's been a variety of um, diverse stakeholders that are interested in this topic. So individuals on behalf of employers, employees, union members, policymakers, legislatures coming together and putting um, thought into useful, hopefully useful, and comprehensive tools to interpret that new system. <coughs> So they, um, there are printouts in the materials that Jessica prepared. I'm also gonna go over them today, uh, but that's part of what I'm here to hopefully talk about. So um, what we're gonna discuss, I'm gonna lead things off. I'm gonna provide a little bit of semantics for some of the terminology that's related to this issue, the difference between a pay gap um, and pay equity. I'll talk about the laws that govern these at a very high level, and then talk about some of the, the areas of interest that employers face and some of the more nuanced uh, litigation trends that we're seeing. Uh, for the record, I'm not going to be commenting on any current or pending litigation, uh, but I will be providing some high-level overview of, of the issues that we see. So, uh, at the outset, and I jo know Jessica touched on this a little bit, uh, difference between the pay gap and pay equity. The pay, up, the pay gap is probably what you've heard in equal pay day announcements that women are still earning earning 80 cents on the dollar for 2020 it looks like that's going to go down a little bit um, but the pay gap in and of itself is not unlawful that is a general measurement of the working men earning more than working women on average it's not taking into account um, the type of work they're doing their job or their um, level pay equity is a measure to compare employees that are doing what the law describes as substantially similar work or equal work. And so you're gonna be focusing on the unique job 
duties, responsibilities, and skills associated with those roles to identify your comparators. Um, and pay discrimination is when those comparators, so men and women, are being paid unequally for doing substantially the same work. And that's where the litigation comes in. That is what is unlawful. Okay. So, a lot of information on this slide, and I'm not going to dig into the, the nuances of the various different patchwork of laws, um, but I wanted to put this up here to highlight that there are many different standards at play. There's the Federal Equal Pay Act at play, there's Title VII, if you're a federal contractor, there's also Executive Order Number 11246, and a myriad of different state equal pay laws. These can speak to what are comparators, what are the defenses, pay transparency, and prior salary laws. And so for employers, um, or for anyone that is litigating this issue, it's important to identify what form you're in, what standard applies, and that will be a key issue in identifying um, which employees the law considers to be as comparators. Again, a lot of information here. I won't read the standards verbatim. I think that they are similar in that they speak to identifying employees that are doing substantially similar work. Under Title VII, it's similarly situated. Under the federal EPA, it's substantially equal. And California has the mouthful of a standard. Um, substantially similar work when viewed as a composite of skill, effort, and responsibility and performed under similar working conditions. Um, what these do is how do you identify employees within a workforce that are doing the same or substantially similar work? And we'll do, drill into a little bit of those dynamics um, in the next couple of slides. Another um, hot topic is how do you consider, or more importantly, not consider, prior salary in um, setting starting pay. So in California, especially since January 29 of this, 2019 of this year, um, it makes it abundantly clear that prior salary cannot be requested or considered uh, when setting starting salary. Under federal law, the courts are not as clear. Um, the circuits are not split, but they come down in different areas. Most recently in the Ninth Circuit, I know Jessica's familiar with this, it's the Rizzo case, um, where the Ninth Circuit came out and expressly prohibited any reliance on prior salary and starting pay. Uh, that's since been overturned on procedural grounds, but I think the trend um, with this case and with the number of state equal pay laws that speak to this directly, including California, um, it appears that the federal standard um, may be moot in some instances, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. We get a lot of questions, um, especially when this law came out, on well, if we can't ask for prior pay, how can we be competitive? Because part of um, what I have experienced, both on the task force and in representing employers, they want to do the right thing. They want to pay their employees fairly, and they want to be competitive in the market and up against um, competitors. And so I have a couple of slides here that speak to that. Um, and the task force goes into this as well. Um, if you want to be competitive, the most effective way is to look at the market data. What is the market willing to pay for that job? How are your competitors paying for that job? And set a salary range. Think about before you go into the, um, the meeting or the interview on what is our company willing to pay for this range. The task force guidance that is published and I think is consistent with the law is you can ask what are your salary expectations. How, do what you, how does what you bring to the table support um, the amount of uh, salary that you are expecting? And you can have that conversation. Something we talked a lot about in the task force is how this law is intended to empower women to come to the table and to negotiate. Um, and so by prohibiting inquiry into, well, what are you making now, you're, you're um, encouraging any candidate to come in and say, well, this is what I anticipate or this is what I deserve to make because these are my skills. These are my responsibilities. So to have that negotiation. Employers should be ready to, to discuss the pay scale. California law requires that if someone asks or a, upon reasonable request, you need to disclose the pay scale of what that job entails so that they know where in that range um, they would expect to, to be compensated and to negotiate for that. Another issue that comes up a lot more frequently is pay audits. So if you represent employers or if you are here on behalf of an employer, if you're not already conducting a pay audit, um, it's encouraged that you might consider that. And this is where the standards come into play. So in developing a pay audit, you want to make sure you're relying on accurate data 
and I'll get into a little bit more about that. But the goal of it is to accurately compare employees that are doing substantially similar work. And so how do you do that? Not all practices are really um, fungible, or they don't really fit into that box of, of a data point. And so it involves a basic audit and then further investigation to confirm what you are doing um, reflects what the employer's practices are. So if you look at the task force materials, kind of the first step is to identify who are your substantially similar employees, who are your cohorts, who are the comparators. Um, focus on overall job content, what the employees are actually doing. Um, there's a tendency to want to look just to job title, but that can be a very broad and it's sometimes inaccurate description. And so it's important to look beyond that, or at least be aware that that may not be an accurate reflection of what employees are actually doing. Um, we recommend, and the task force recommends, starting at a very high level job function. So separate out people that are in HR, legal, marketing, sales. Those are all different functions, um, and it wouldn't be an accurate representation to be comparing someone that's in HR with someone who's in legal because they're doing very different types of work. And again, the task force provides benchmarks on how do you define, what do you look for when you're trying to assess someone's skill, effort, and responsibility. Um, and I, I wrote about those, and you can look them up on, on the task force website as well, um, but it seems that those are consistent with the standards that have been applied in Title VII. So although California is a relatively new law and we haven't received a lot of interpretation, uh, there is many years of, of um, guidance and instruction in the Title VII case law. When starting a pay audit, um, this is just, I have it here as basics. It's going to be company by company. It's going to be very employer specific. And in drilling down to find those comparator employees, some factors that may be relevant, depending on the company, might include job title, division, pay level, time with company, time in the job, prior experience. These are all things that people bring to the table or that are relevant to compensation decisions that you may be able to pull out from the data. But sometimes a basic audit isn't the end all and it isn't always accurate. Um, and that could be for a number of reasons. One of them is broad job titles. And so an example could be an HR investigator or an HR counselor. Do all HR counselors within the company perform the same job? Are they doing the same, um, same duties? Do they have the same experience? Um, one HR counselor could be compliance or could be benefits counseling. And they're meeting with individual employees and discussing, here's what your benefits are, here's what the company policies are, et cetera. Another HR investigator could be out there investigating claims of sexual harassment. They're in the field. They're having conversations with witnesses. And those are very distinct skills that would rely on different experience, um, totally different day-to-day -day responsibilities, but they would both be um, in the audit or in the data reflected as an HR counselor. And so if you're going to rely on the data, it's important to also ask questions and understand, well, how does this fit within what's actually happening on the floor? Um, base pay, in the, in the basic pay slide, it talked about using base pay. That may not always be a, um, a full picture of what the total compensation is. So to consider if there are comp commissions, stock grants, any other drivers of pay that may be relevant to include there. Um, to keep things moving along within my time, something about data and statistical analysis and proving these cases is to remember that the data tells a story based on what you put into the model. So it's important to use clear and clean and accurate data and really understand it because the, the results of that model, any statistics that come out of that are going to be a story of what you put into it, which may or may not align with <coughs> what the employer's practices are. And so it's important to um, take that as a starting out point. And we have guidance on this in the task force materials as well. Um, no matter what results come from the data model, use that as step one. And before you go and make changes, because it shows that there may or may not be, or if it shows that there, there is no disparity, ask questions of the employer. Dig in to say, is what the data telling me accurate with how things are and how compensation decisions are made? Um, because the worst thing that you can do is run one test and go out and make a bunch of changes. Um, that could be problematic because perhaps the data wasn't accurate and now the changes you've made um, could create a problem that wasn't there before. 
Or if the, the data reflect that there was, there was no disparity and you do nothing, um, it could be that, that that was a false positive. And so it's really important to take a careful and employer by employer, company by company look um, at, at how you conduct these audits. Um, and with that, I think I've run a little over, so I'll pass it over to Lori. This kind of overlaps what she's going to talk about, but some of the trends that we've seen are uh, defending these, these lawsuits brought under either Rule 23 class action or collective actions, um, which are a little bit of a different standard, different process, and I will uh, turn it over to Lori from there. Great, thank you. So we got a good overview of kind of the employer perspective and some of these proactive steps that employers are taking to ensure that they do have pay equity within their app, within their workforce. So those are some helpful considerations in that regard. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Lori to discuss more about the litigation trends. Thanks, Jessica. Unlike Ms. James, I will be commenting on pending litigation, so I get the fun job. Um, and one, one trend that I'm sure all of you have noticed, because it's getting so much attention, is suits brought on behalf of lawyers. Um, not just big law, but also, and I put these um, in, in basically in date order. Uh, Coates versus Farmers Insurance is a case that I litigated on behalf of all the women attorneys who work for Farmers Insurance. So if you um, are, are insured <coughs> by farmers, you get in a car accident or you cause a car accident, you get sued. Farmers has an obligation to defend your lawsuit. And so they employ a bunch of lawyers, I think like 900 across the country, 300 or so of them are women. And we had some incredible personal stories about people who've been there. Our, our named plaintiff had been there 15 years and she was earning almost half of what her male comparator was earning, even though he had one less year experience than her. And they tried cases together. He referred to her as his partner. She got fantastic performance reviews when she complained about it I can't remember. when she complained about it they demoted her and they basically said you need to be getting him ready for trial anyway I wish I could talk about that case longer there were some really compelling uh, personal stories and that's why I like following all of these cases um, many of them are not mine but they're all very interesting another early one that I started tracking was Craddock versus LeClaire Ryan I see right now in the in the news that they're um, going out of business, apparently. That was an individual case brought in the Eastern District of Virginia. Um, not a whole lot of litigation there. Campbell versus Chadbourne has a much longer docket, more complicated case. It was really honestly kind of particularly ugly, the allegations that were flying back and forth between the parties. It eventually settled um, the, the three individual plaintiffs who had joined that lawsuit. Um, interestingly, Chadbourne, uh, was represented by Proskauer Rose and then and also Sidley Austin and of course later you'll see that Proskauer has also been the subject of one of these big suits. Uh, Rivera versus Sedgwick. Um, this case was brought in I think state court then removed to the Northern District of California. It was brought as a class case, settled individually. There was an arbitration agreement that was determined to be enforceable. Um, that was Judge Alsop's decision <laughs> and he in his very unique Judge Alsop way grumbled about it while he did it, but he did it. And that case went to arbitration and settled on an individual basis. And by the way, um, always, it's my style in this, in this litigation, in this type of litigation, to do my best not to criticize the defendants because equal pay is just an issue that women are confronting in every single industry and in every single company in the United States. And the beauty of our laws is that we don't have to prove intentional discrimination. We just have to show that the women are doing equal or substantially similar work and they're not getting paid as much. Most of my clients love their jobs and, and, and they don't want to sling mud. So um, I'm always trying to avoid doing that and um, therefore my commentary today is not to cast dispersions on any of these defendant uh, law firms. The next one that is of great interest, and I'm sure will be to everyone in this room, is Ramos versus Winston and Strawn. Um, this case, there's a cert petition pending in the US Supreme Court right now. Uh, the opposition to cert got filed just a week ago on July 31st. Um, Noah Leibovitz is representing Constance Ramos. It's an individual case. The California Court of Appeal found that the arbitration agreement in place uh, was unconscionable and it applied the Armendariz factors even after Lewis versus Epic Systems. 
um, it found that the unlawful provisions in the contract were not severable and therefore the entire arbitration agreement was unenforceable. The California Supreme Court declined review, I think in January or February of this year, and uh, presumably the Supreme Court will decide on cert in the next term. So I think in a few months we'll have more information about that um, important case. Next one, Doe versus Proskauer. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, Huck versus Steptoe and Johnson. This is another one of my cases. Um, we sued Steptoe and Johnson in Central District of California under the Fair Labor Standards Act, hoping, hoping to uh, conditionally certify a nationwide class action. Unfortunately, Lewis versus Epic Systems came down during the pendency of that lawsuit, and our case was shunted to individual arbitration. It later settled. Um, Williams versus Jones Day is another very active case brought on behalf of lawyers. It's a class case. Uh, just today, I read in Law 360 that uh, the fourth and final named plaintiff has lost her bid to proceed as a doe. Uh, three of them had dropped their attempt to proceed as a doe, um, but the judge was not having it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, Nepper versus Ogletree. This is another really complicated long docket. There's multiple cases. Um, it, there was a venue fight. There's an arbitration agreement fight. The thing that I found that was interesting about this case is that the second amended complaint is sealed. And I find that bizarre. So anyway, uh, but we could talk more about secrecy and civil litigation in another panel. Um, it's another uh, <laughs> annoying thing that I follow. All right, so suits against law firms. Some issues that we all, in, in litigating these cases, have to grapple with on the other side, and that is, as I alluded to earlier, whether you can be a DOE plaintiff. Um, I've mentioned the standard in federal court and also cited the two key Ninth Circuit cases. And then, as I mentioned, there's a couple of good law firm examples. If you're interested in this, you should check out these dockets. Uh, the Proskauer and the Jones Day docket, in particular, are very needy. So Jane Doe's status, do not take this for granted. I haven't even tried it in an equal pay case, but Sanford Heisler lawyers regularly try it and they are frequently successful. Um, that surprised me when they started doing it a few years ago because the standard is really high, but some judges are open to it and they've made good arguments and, and excellent legal briefs out there as examples if you want to try it. Uh, the Northern District of California is, among other jurisdictions, fairly lenient about this, but really not all judges are. And these two cases that I cite here are, are fascinating cases. Advanced Textile was a Fair Labor Standards Act case brought on behalf of workers in Saipan. And there was evidence of real physical threats. Um, these were not speculative concerns that the workers had. There were threats of deportation and financial harm brought on these plaintiffs. Um, the, the plaintiffs argued that they had, um, or well, the court found, sorry, that they had an objectively reasonable fear of extraordinarily severe retaliation and justifying anonymity. Um, but the district court and ultimately the Ninth Circuit limited their anonymity to pre-certification proceedings. Why that's relevant, I don't know. It seems like the same concern about retaliation would exist post-certification, but that's the ruling in that case. Um, Advanced Textiles also mentions a Fifth Circuit case from 1979 where female lawyers, women lawyers who sued uh, Southern Methodist University over discriminatory hiring practices were not permitted to continue under Jane Doe's status since the harm that they feared, blackballing, uh, constituted no greater threat of retaliation than the typical plaintiff in Title VII cases. And that's the same reasoning that just got applied in Jones Day a couple days ago. It's a very high standard. And then the last case, that, or the second case that I mentioned is Doe versus Kamehameha Schools. I also found this a fascinating read. It's the Ninth Circuit who said that no, these children do not warrant Jane Doe status because the threats they received were really just online taunting and not, they weren't real. They were more speculative in nature. And that case involved some white non Hawaiian students wanting to get into the Kamehameha schools, which have traditionally been reserved, those spots have traditionally been reserved for Native Hawaiians. Um, so, the reasoning that the Ninth Circuit applied was emphasizing that the court has a paramount importance of openness in the court. So that's what you're up against on the Doe question. 
All right, other litigation trends and issues, obviously uh, Lewis versus Epic Systems, and I mentioned Winston and Strawn already, so uh, watch watch this space for that issue. And can we just mention the quick, uh, Epic Systems for anyone who isn't familiar with the overall takeaway from Epic Systems? Oh, well, it's just that arbitration agreements can be enforced in the employment setting, um, overturning the Ninth Circuit precedent, and it was of a trio of cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, Jessica. Oh, and just specific, um, specifically class waivers were found to be um, legal and were upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, so it effectively affects yeah. everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so another interesting issue in the context of lawyers suing for equal pay is whether they're really an employee or a partner. And this is another issue that has been tackled in many of these cases where I was initially skeptical, but um, there have been some good rulings finding that if you're a non-equity partner or a junior partner, really you might be viewed as an employee under California law. And um, even though you have a partnership agreement which dictates how much you're going to make, if you can demonstrate to the court that you meet the uh, factors and the standard for the definition of an, an employee, um, you may be able to succeed in your equal pay cases uh, despite the fact that the arbitration agreement dictated your compensation. Okay. Um, I won't go into great detail about the differences between Rule 23 class action and FLSA collective action, but I will mention that this is a strategic a decision that we plaintiffs need to make at the outset of the case, and I think there are some real benefits to a collective action in, in large part because it's an opt-in situation. You have a lower standard for conditional certification. It comes earlier in the case. If you get it, you get to send notice to every, you know, every member of your collective action, so that could potentially be sending thousands of letters out to women employees around the country saying you may have an equal pay case, and uh, likely that's going to bring additional individual plaintiffs into your case, and that is, tactically speaking, excellent insurance. If you later get decertified, you still get to try all of the cases that came in on an individual basis, um, unless they get thrown out for some other reason. As I mentioned, we don't have to prove intentional discrimination, and under the FLSA, we, there's no exhaustion requirement, so it makes getting on file just slightly easier with a surprise factor. Double damages, of course, are also available under the Fair Labor Standards Act, so that can be a benefit as well. Some other litigation trends that I'm following, and I do wish I had more time to talk about all these really fascinating cases, some of which have been brought um, by excellent attorneys sitting in this room. But here's a long list uh, of equal pay cases brought against tech companies. Um, I don't think there's anything really unusual about tech companies. I think um, there's... Um, well, that may not be true. I mean, uh, women in STEM lately, I guess, have, no, that's not true either. Women women, women are graduating in STEM at like equal numbers or even greater numbers than men in the graduate program. So there's nothing different about tech. It's just equally bad. And lots of people are suing them, so awesome. <laughs> okay, and I see Felicia sitting over there. Wellens versus Daiichi, um, which is a case she litigated, was really my standard from the beginning when I started doing these cases. I read every brief that she ever wrote. I don't know how you fit so many citations into a brief, but you're an incredible brief writer. Um, so I, I liked that case. I liked the result in that case. Um, and that was kind of an early tech-focused equal pay case. All right. Also, and I'll also sing the praises of Kelly Dermody. I started my legal career here at Leaf Cabraser, and Kelly taught me almost everything I know. Um, she is engaged in some epic battles against finance. <laughs> And these three cases, Goldman Sachs, KPMG, and Merrill Lynch, all have dockets that are thousands of pleading, you know, documents long. Um, and there's been some incredible victories. I'd love to talk more about those, but there is no time. Uh, Jessica mentioned self-audits. And, um, you know, we, we all hopefully know about what Mark Benioff is doing with Salesforce. He did a self-audit a few years ago, found a $3 million pay gap. <coughs> he corrected it. This was at the urging of two of his female vice presidents, by the way, so let's not give him all the credit. Um, but he did the right thing. A year later, they said, well, let's look at it again and just make sure. Salesforce employs 30,000 employees. They found that the pay gap had opened up again, and he spent another $3 million the next year correcting the pay gap. So when you have so many employees coming in and out, in and out of your company, and there are so many decisions being made on a daily and weekly basis, 
that pay gap is persistent and women can be responsible for those bad subjective decisions as well. When the managers are certainly not immune to this. So Salesforce and now something like 30 other California based companies have all taken the pledge that Jennifer Siebel Newsom, the California's first spouse, um, has um, put out there for companies to sign on to. And they're all pledging to do self audits every year. So I think that's a tremendous victory and California is really leading the way on this. Worldwide, I'm also paying attention to what's happening. There are other countries, including the UK, that are requiring um, standard reporting by large companies. Um, I have a friend in Manchester, England, who's suing ASDA and Walmart on behalf of their something like 300,000 employees. It's a huge number for equal pay. Now, their suit just got taken up by the UK Supreme Court, and they have to show that the jobs are comparable, of comparable worth, which is a different thing. Um, but I'm following the case, and it's interesting. Um, in the UK, Walt Disney also last year in their reporting um, showed a 22% pay gap between what women working for Disney and what men working for Disney in the UK are earning. So worldwide, people are paying attention to this. And I think it's in part because of the excitement that some Hollywood figures uh, brought to the issue a few years back. And if there's time later in the panel, um, I'll, I'll address that in more detail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. And so we are definitely going to save time at the end for questions. And so if some of those pending questions are <coughs> pending, uh, we can definitely talk more about that. Um, so thank you. Um, now we're going to turn over to Fred. We've heard about kind of the, the context of litigation, the trends that are out there. Um, and Fred's going to talk to us some about the different considerations that come into play around settlement of these types of equal pay cases. That's it. Well, since so many of our cases actually get settled as opposed to tried, um, Jessica thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit more about what happens on the other side of that <coughs> line, and uh, and so that's kind of what I'm going to focus on uh, in just a few minutes and raise some topics. Um, I, I think um, initially I'd say that oops, initially I'd say that there's sort of an inflection point in this whole area of litigation about how these these cases get handled? Do they handle are they handled sort of more like wage and hour cases where you collect a certain amount of money based on how many people work there, how many work weeks, and all that, or do you do a more like classic Title VII cases where it's more about the programmatically relief, although there's plenty of money involved, but the focus tends to be on how do we fix this problem? Um, and I and I think these cases come in both categories. Um, the the, the question really, I think, is, if, if, particularly for the employer, is do you have this case again right after you settle it, or do you figure out what's going on and what caused it and try to address it, and you use um, the, the effort and the thoughts and the insight of the plaintiff's lawyers to help you get to the bottom of the problem. So um, I guess what I want to focus on is the programmatic stuff, because I think it's more interesting than the money stuff, but that's just me. Um, what's really interesting to me about the programmatic relief, uh, and there's lawyers in this room who've done some amazing programmatic relief, I'd like to hear from them on some of this, is, is you have to think about what's the problem? You know, what created the pay gap? And you can imagine uh, those are complicated, that's a complicated question. You know, there's probably many causes for certain pay gaps. Um, you know, it isn't just a bunch of guys who are saying, let's pay the women this and then that. It's a much more complicated world. Uh, and so figuring out what the causes are, and then getting lawyers in conference rooms in the middle of litigation to try to work together to figure that out, um, especially since they, it's not a laboratory where they can try out different ideas, but it's, they have in a conference room and the mediator beating on them to say, let's settle this case. They have to try to come up with, you know, the 20 things that will work, and they have to do it together. Uh, and they have very different perspectives on what the problem might have been. So it's a very challenging scenario, but I think it's really interesting. And it's some of the great work that lawyers do, is to try to sort out what the problem is. But even if they can figure out what the problem is, the solution isn't always very obvious. Um, you can imagine that a lot of the solutions can be very debatable. Um, 
And then even if you can come up with a consensus on what the solutions are and put them in your consent decree, uh, then because it's a dynamic process, it's a decree over a period of time, how, do you, how can you tell that it's actually working? How can you tell that you know, the very smart lawyers have figured this out in the conference room and put all this stuff in the decree that it actually works? And, and finally, because it's a dynamic process, you have to put some flexibility in the decree that will allow you to pivot to different solutions if the ones you came up with way back when in that conference room weren't actually the, the, the right fix. So to me, this is fascinating work, and I think it um, you know, brings the best out of the lawyers who really try to focus on this, particularly since they've been against across the table in litigation before they started trying to address this problem. So what's in programmatic relief? Let me just list them here because you can look at any decree and you'll see a lot of different terms. But essentially, um, the, the parties typically agree to change some policies, you know, whether they're policies that put some control on discretion or policies that say that particular variables must be considered in pay, uh, whether they're flexibility in the workplace kind of issues, there's a lot of policies that can be part of the solution here. There also has to be some responsibility and ownership by the people who have to implement the agreement and the decree, and that tends to be put in the decree itself. Uh, there's questions of how you communicate the various changes that are happening. Um, there's typically internal monitoring that <coughs> whether this is working, or who's responsible for doing this and doing that. These are complicated companies. Uh, there's lots of moving parts, lots of organizations, and somebody has to be in charge of various things, and so that's typically covered. Uh, then there's also some metrics. You know, what should we be counting to tell that whether we fix this problem or not? And so there's a lot of, you'll see metrics of various kinds in consent decrees or settlement agreements that resolve these types of cases. Um, I mentioned the topic of flexibility, which I think is a critical one because things change, maybe you didn't get the right idea, that has to be in there. The topic of outside helpers, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, also comes up. You know, do you need experts, do you need consultants, do you need a monitor, do you need a special master? Uh, outsiders tend to be a critical part of the negotiations of these cases, uh, and so it's a topic that comes up. And then finally, how do you resolve disputes? Let me just mention a few things that at least in my experience, um, sort of lead to effective types of uh, consent decrees in this area. There are a lot of different mindsets associated with how you do culture change in a place uh, in the context of a consent decree. Uh, and all of these mindsets sort of operate together. There'll be some defense sort of residue left from litigating the case, and so defense lawyers will be involved, and, and they just institutionally think about, gee, we're not gonna, if we didn't do it, we're not gonna change this, it's fine. So that defense mentality is part of the picture. But there's also a compliance mentality that sort of moves into the environment when these cases get settled. Uh, and those tend to be people who say, look, it says we're supposed to do this, let's do that. But beyond that, you see other mindsets come into place, like what I would call the culture change people, who say, well, we know we have this decree, but this is really good stuff, we should be changing our culture, and the decree kind of cheapens what we're doing, so we want to think about culture change. Uh, and then the final mindset, which I think tends to be the biggest driver, is whether the business people can see this as a kind of a win-win solution. You know, if the, if the decree requires them to do things that's good for business, they can get behind it. And so there's a mindset that comes into the dynamic uh, from that place as well. The other thing that's um, very effective in, in decrees is measurement. You know, what gets measured gets done. The lawyer in here, two lawyers in here, who've used that phrase with me a lot. Um, it's funny, when I was I'm, I'm monitoring company in Florida, and I was there on a monitoring visit, and on the wall they had a big sign painted, what gets measured gets done, and so I looked at the degree, I said, you see, this is 
we all agree on this point. Um, but when you figure that out, you've got to make sure you're measuring something that matters. And sometimes it's hard to figure out what that is. You also have to worry about whether what you're measuring you know, creates some perverse incentives or uh, produces unintended consequences. So these are very complicated things to think about, but you know what, what gets measured gets done. But there's a pretty good debate on the next one. You don't hear too many people say what gets trained gets done. Uh, and there's a, there's a, everybody wants to have training, but query does it really work their studies and say that it doesn't have much impact. Uh, but that issue comes up. Uh, I mentioned earlier that fine tuning and flexibility is important when you're trying to change a, a, an organization over the course of a few years. And so that's part of it. Uh, but I think maybe the most important part is a sort of a, a partnership of the parties. I mean, if you can get the parties to feel like they're aligned in terms of the interest behind why the decree was entered into or the settlement agreement was reached, you could make some real impact. But if the parties are not aligned, if they're not pushing together, then you end up spending several years just fighting with each other. And that's not typically the key to effectiveness. Let me talk just a little bit about the outsiders involved. Typically, um, the question comes up, should there be a consultant of some sort to help the company do this? Should there be an expert involved who can count things and give advice on various things? Should there be a monitor to make sure things are happening? Uh, do you need a special master? These are all sort of outsiders who get involved in these decrees. And in a lot of ways, these folks all help do some really important things. Uh, I think they help close some settlement gaps. What I mean by that is when, when, you're, when the parties are negotiating, um, you know, they may agree on some things and then the defense will say, okay, we, we agreed to do the following 20 things, trust us, we'll get it done. And then the plaintiff's lawyers will say, well, we agree on these 20 things, but why don't you trust us to make sure you're getting it done and we want all the information and whatever. And the, and the defense will say, well, we don't want you in our business. And so they have to, they end up saying, well, let's get somebody else to do the role of making sure that this gets done. And that's where a monitor comes in or a consultant comes in. You know, we'll hire somebody that you agree to to help us understand how this works or that works. Or we'll hire somebody that you agree with who will help us figure out what the problem actually is. So, so I, I see that as sort of a, a way to bridge a gap in a contentious debate in the settlement process over particular items. Uh, it's also a way to kick some issues down the road. You know, if you can't agree in settlement on a certain thing, then you're bringing an outsider to help figure out down the road a few things that you can't resolve. Um, there's also trust issues that are involved in in settlements and then having the outsiders come in and they, they close the gap. <coughs> and they can also be sort of a buffer on the rough edges that come from the fact that the parties were litigated over some time. So I think there's some really positive roles that these folks play and you tend to see them in, in complicated decrees. Let me talk a little bit about monitors because that's something that I do a fair amount of. Um, this is a very interesting role. Um, because you play a lot of different roles. Uh, you know, your principal role, and this is all defined in the decree, because monitors have a lot of different, it can be anything the parties agree to. But monitors can be very helpful because they, they're focused on compliance. You know, there's a piece of paper that says do the following 20 things, and it's their job to make sure those 20 things happen, or there's a reason why they didn't. But there's also some consulting that comes out of this role where uh, the parties will say, gee, how can we, what do you think about how we can solve this problem? Sometimes there's some decision making. The parties will say, look, we'll want the monitor to decide a couple of things down the road. Uh, there's a lot of communication facilitation. Uh, you know, when I do this work, I sometimes have somebody on the phone saying one thing about how bad everything is, and then the other party's on the phone saying how great everything is. And it's my job to try to have them understand each other a little bit better. So there's some communication facilitation that I think otherwise might get 
might create more diversity than it needs to be. Uh, there's some reality checks. Um, oftentimes the parties will ask me, so is this really working or is it not working or should we take this position or that position? And it's nice to have somebody in the middle who can help with some reality check. Um, maybe, maybe more important or very important is sort of the notion of focus. Um, when you litigate for several years over a big case, then you settle it, and then you have a decree for three or four or five or six or seven years, everybody moves on to the next case. They still have these cases and they still have to deal with them. But it's nice to have somebody whose only job is to make sure that case gets, that, that decree does what it's supposed to do, and that's part of what the monitor does. The monitor can also be a cheerleader. You know, for GR, we're doing great to get everybody on a positive track. Sometimes the monitor can be sort of a boogeyman. You know, the, the company will go back to the man managers and say, you know, if we don't fix this, this monitor's gonna come in and look at your stuff and ask you a lot of questions. And sometimes the monitor can be a club. You know, if, if, it, if the monitor is having trouble with coming to the conclusion that there's been compliance here, the company tends to respond to that. Um, finally, I think the role of the outside person can help everybody just get to the end of the process and hopefully execute on these brilliant ideas that the lawyers had five or six years ago in the, in the conference room. So that's my set of comments on this. Thank you, Fred. That's a super helpful. I, I made Fred do this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I think it is a perspective I haven't heard in many of the equal pay panels I've seen or been on uh, this specific settlement piece. And we all know that that's usually how these, case ends, these cases end. So that was super helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the legislative trends in this area. Um, and so just kind of as a reminder, we heard the really helpful what kind of presentation of the fact that there's the kind of Title VII type cases around pay discrimination where a woman is being paid less than a man um, uh, that, that would require some intent um, on the part of the employer. Um, and then there's the equal pay cases where there is no intent required. The woman simply has to show that she's being paid less than a man for equal or substantially similar work. Alternatively, a man could also sue uh, to sh and say that he is being paid less than a woman for equal or substantially similar work. And so the policy um, uh, trends that we've been seeing address kind of those different types of, of cases. Um, and then, of course, in the beginning, we talked about the overall gender wage gap, which has many different contributors that aren't necessarily um, unlawful. And so there are a whole other set of policy uh, and legislative trends that address those, such as increasing paid family leave um, and other types of workplace supports that I won't get into today. Um, these are really focused on uh, legislative trends around it, um, it, it, making our equal pay laws stronger. So. Okay, so we heard a lot about the use of prior salary, and that is a big trend in the legislative field in this area. Um, as we've heard, there is this pay gap that exists in pretty much every industry and occupation in this country, except for, I think, four, and this is all based on census data. And it's interesting to me, one, the one of those four is shoe shiners, which is interesting. <laughs> I feel like there just aren't a lot of women shoe shiners in, in that area. Um, and so we know that this exists, this pay gap, in all these industries. And so when you have employers relying on a candidate's past salary, um, you're perpetuating past pay you know, disparities and possible discrimination. Um, so this trend has basically been that legislatures are either prohibiting employers from asking about uh, prior pay of a candidate or prohibiting um, and or prohibiting them from relying on prior pay in setting a candidate's pay. And pretty much I think all of them do have the caveat that if the candidate wishes to disclose that information, then the employer can, of course, rely on that and discuss that with the candidate. Um, so since 2016, six states, as well as several cities, have enacted bills in this regard. Um, and then just as an as a, uh, additional note, both California and Washington also provide that prior salary can't be used as a defense to a uh, wage disparity under those state pay laws, equal pay laws. Um, in California, it specifically says that prior salary can't be used at all, even if other factors are um, also proposed by the, by the employer, prior salary cannot be um, used in any part of that defense. Um, so the second trend, okay, these are the sub parts, um, is expanding protections to characteristics other than sex. 
So as we all know, workers often experience discrimination based on characteristics other than sex, such as race or disability, and often that discrimination is intersectional. So someone might be discriminated against in pay or otherwise based on her gender and her race or on her disability and her gender. Um, so some of these laws, uh, state laws that are being passed address that issue. Um, the Federal Equal Pay Act and many state equal pay laws only prohibit unequal pay based on um, uh, sex. However, some of these states are trying to address that by increasing those characteristics or expanding those characteristics. So some examples of that in California, our equal pay law now includes race and ethnicity. In Oregon, it actually, uh, the equal pay law is extended to protect all the protected classes under their anti-discrimination law. Um, so that's a pretty broad list. And that's also the same in New Jersey. So we're talking national origin, civil union status. Um, the kind of proof questions there, to me, remain to be seen, how you would actually go about um, litigating such a case, but those are the laws on the books in that regard and kind of reflect the, the reality of, of these intersectional discrimination claims. Um, so the next broad kind of bucket of legislative trends is um, broader comparisons of work and pay. So as we've heard, the Federal Equal Pay Act prohibits unequal pay or requires, I should say, equal pay for equal work. Um, some courts are kind of more narrowly, or, and many state laws also require um, you know, state equal work. Um, some, of the, some courts have really narrowly applied those laws and kind of rigidly applied them and thrown out at cases on kind of very minute or seemingly irrelevant differences in work because they were not kind of exactly equal. So in response to that, some states have adopted laws that expand that. So one example, of course, is here in California where we have the substantially similar standard of work um, and as Jessica mentioned, the, that, that is viewed as a composite of skill, effort, and responsibility. Um, similarly, in New Jersey, uh, they also have a substantially similar standard. Um, Oregon requires equal pay for work of comparable character, and that's long been their, their standard, um, but it was recently amended, their state law, to kind of define what that means, and kind of sim similar to California, comparable character means substantially similar knowledge, skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions regardless of the job description. So kind of recognizing the, the, the modern era of work um, and recognizing that, that people can be doing pretty similar work and should be getting paid equally for that, even if there are some minute differences um, in what they're doing. The next bucket of trends in the legislative arena is tightening um, employer defenses. So we haven't talked a lot about um, all the defenses that exist under the Federal Equal Pay Act and many of the state laws, um, but the kind of defense that's often litigated that I've seen is the factor other than sex defense. So if a, if a let's say, woman plaintiff establishes her prima facie case, she's a woman getting paid less than a man who's doing either equal or substantially similar work, the burden then shifts to the employer to show one of the enumerated defenses. And the factor other than sex defense says that if the employer can show that that difference in pay was based on some other factor other than sex, um, then, then, then that's a valid defense. Um, that has sometimes been construed by some courts pretty broadly. Um, so some of the states have taken, taken steps to kind of limit that. So an example, of course, again, is California. Um, and and uh, basically, like New Jersey and Washington, so the, those three states, uh, it has to be a bona fide factor other than sex. It has to have been applied reasonably, <coughs> account for the entire wage differential. Um, so for instance, if the woman is making $10,000 less than the man for equal work, and the employer says, well, he had an extra year of education, that one year of education likely wouldn't, although it really, of course, is fact specific, uh, account for that full $10,000 differential. Um, and then finally, in those three states, the uh, factor has to have been based on some legitimate business necessity, that other factor other than sex. Um, specifically in New Jersey and California, our law here and in New Jersey provide that um, the factor cannot be a legitimate business necessity if there's some alternative business practice that would have served the same business purpose but would not have resulted in the wage disparity. Um, and then finally, Oregon has a kind of enumerated set of reasons that an employer can show as some bona fide factor other than sex. Okay, um, next big bucket is pay transparency. And that kind of overall term is used, I've heard it referring to different types of, um, of laws. Um, but pay transparency is a big issue because people often aren't aware of what they are being, what their coworkers are being paid, and thus it's hard to figure out if they're being paid equally for equal or substantially similar work. Um, so there's a few different subsets of these laws that we're seeing come up. Um, the first one has to do with pay secrecy prohibitions. 
Um, so employers are, are often institute policies within their companies that prohibit or discourage workers from talking about or disclosing their pay. A 2014 survey, survey by the Institute for Women's Policy Research found that more than 60% of private sector workers reported that their employer either prohibits or discourages employers from discussing pay. Um, and so we've heard from workers that, that, that there are actually policies in place saying that they can't talk about that. Um, so it's up to now 18 states, as well as the District of Columbia, have enacted laws that prohibit employers from retaliating against workers for either discussing or disclosing their pay, and, and California is included in that. Um, just a side note, if your state doesn't actually outright explicitly prohibit such retaliation uh, for discussing pay, workers may have an argument under the National Labor Relations Act um, that they should not be uh, prohibited or retaliated against from discussing pay with another worker because that type of talk or discussion could be could constitute a concerted protected activity and it would be illegal for an employer to, to, to retaliate against them for engaging in that activity. Um, another trend in this pay transparency area is that of providing <coughs> salary ranges. So an example that Jessica mentioned earlier is that here in California, we our law requires employers upon reasonable requests to provide the pay scale for a position in question uh, to an applicant for employment. Um, and so the law was further amended to clarify that pay scale means the sour, salary, salary or hourly range for a position in question. Um, and upon reasonable request means that the applicant had to have had at least one interview with the employer. Um, so that's when, an, when a worker would be entitled to that range. Some other states, though, have been a bit more broad and have required employers to provide that even before someone's had an interview. And the trend is to go even further and say that employers should just post the range when they post their job posting. And all of this, of course, is to try to help workers be able to know what the world of options is um, to be able to negotiate within that and not lowball themselves. Okay, um, the last one within paid transparency is this issue of pay data collection and reporting. And as you've heard about today and have probably read about in the news, there's a definitely been a trend of employers like Salesforce, Starbucks, a lot of big ones, City um, Bank, and many other big companies have chosen to voluntarily do pay audits. And when they do, lo and behold, they find pay disparities. As we heard from Jessica, sometimes these pay disparities may not be unlawful, but it does kind of bring them to take a closer look, and if they find that there is no valid reason to fix it. And like Benioff did at Salesforce at the urging of his uh, two female uh, 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 people, women in leadership, um, he paid the difference, billions of dollars in difference. Um, so that uh, pay data reporting so far is not yet required under the law, um, but here it is. Um, but that is one trend that we are going to see in the states. Um, and in California right now, we have a bill pending. Full disclosure, my organization is co-sponsoring that bill. Um, and it's SB 171, introduced by State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson. And that bill would require employers of 100 or more employees in California to collect and report pay data broken down by race, gender, ethnicity, and job <coughs> category uh, to the state uh, enforcement agency, which is the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. And the idea there would be to incentivize employers to conduct these types of pay audits, and if they find disparities, to kind of look deeper and see whether they're justified, and if not, fix them. And then also to help our state agency with affirmative enforcement of our equal pay laws by getting this data. Um, and that's modeled under uh, on a federal rule that I'll talk a bit about after this slide. Um, okay, so on the federal level, I wanted to just note the federal development, which is the Paycheck Fairness Act. So this uh, bill has been introduced in many, 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 uh, every session for the last... Since 93. 93, okay. And really the intent of the Paycheck Fairness Act is to try to close what some see as loopholes or at least kind of gaps in protections under the Federal Equal Pay Act. Um, <coughs> the Pay Act was passed in 1963, thank you. Um, I memorized that for the Ninth Circuit. Um, so passed in 1963 and has not been amended, and so it really doesn't reflect a lot of the kind of changing nature of the workforce and how these equal pay claims come up. And so as you've heard, the states are kind of trying to address those gaps through uh, strengthening their own state laws. And what the Paycheck Fairness do, Act would do is really try to strengthen uh, the federal law in a lot of the ways that the states are doing it. So changing it from an equal work standard to a substantially similar work standard, limiting the use of salary history, again, prohibiting uh, retaliation against workers who talk about pay. Increase it would also increase the penalties that are available to plaintiffs in these cases, 
it would tighten up the employer defense, the bona fide factor than sex defense, to really make an employer show that that other factor than sex, other factor than sex that caused the disparity was business related, and there was no other way to accomplish that business purpose without causing the disparity. And finally, it would require the pay data collection uh, piece that I mentioned. So just quickly, um, because it's kind of developing now, um, the SB 171, the pay data bill that I mentioned here in California, is modeled after a federal rule. Um, during the Obama administration, the EEOC revised the EEO1 form, which is a form that's been used for 50 years, uh, where large employers of 100 or more employees have to report demographic data about their workforces to the EEOC. So under the Obama administration, the EEOC, in an attempt to address this wage and rate, you know, gender and race wage gap that we've been talking so much about, revised that form to require employers to also report pay data broken down by race, gender, ethnicity, and job category. Um, the Trump administration uh, stayed that rule. It was set to go into effect March 2018. Employers were all set to start reporting or were getting set to start reporting it. Uh, and then, uh, the Office of Management and Budget stayed that rule, put a halt to it. The uh, National Women's Law Center and another uh, couple other organizations filed a lawsuit, and they actually got an opinion earlier this year that requires the EEOC to start collecting that data. Um, it said that the stay was um, an unlawful stay and that the, the rule had to proceed. So as of now, uh, employers are set to start reporting or required to start reporting in September. Um, unclear where that might go, but as of now they are set to start and the EEOC has opened their portal for such reporting to begin. So that um, we'll see where that goes. Okay. So that's um, kind of the, the bucket of legislative trends that we're seeing in this area. And now we have time for questions. So I'll turn it over to Becky. So with these new reporting obligations, the EEOC one, and if we get it, the California one, will employees have any way of seeing that data? That's a great question. So the question is about how publicly available the data will be if SB 171 passes in California, and when and if the federal reporting continues. Um, unfortunately, no. Well, unfortunately for employees. Um, the, the federal rule is the revised EEO-1 form, and that data that's already being collected via the EEO-1 form that's been collected for the past 50 years, it's confidential, so it goes straight to the EEOC, it's not publicly available, and it's not even FOIA-able. And I'm guessing that's just due to, you know, business pressures when that rule was enacted, you know, way back when. Uh, and the California bill is modeled on that. There are definitely uh, legislators who want to go further. So here in California, a couple years ago, there was a bill, Assemblywoman uh, Gonzalez, that would have required employers to put on their website, uh, to publish on their website and, and report to the state agency uh, the gender wage gaps, but that bill was uh, vetoed by the governor. But I think we'll see more bills where it would go even further um, in terms of transparency in that regard. On a quick follow-up to that, do, if you file an EEOC complaint um, against an employer that has a reporting obligation like this, can the investigator access the confidential data? That's a good question. The data is aggregate, so the data that employers report to the EEOC or would report to, in California if, if this bill passes is aggregate data and it's not bro broken down by individual worker. So the EEOC could see that, that, that there are these disparities in a company, uh, but they would not be able to kind of use it as specific, which could still be you know evidence, but it wouldn't be worker specific. And again, the kind of policy reason behind this pay data collection and reporting rule at the federal level and in California is besides incentivizing employers to look and, and fix gaps that they might find, is also for these affirmative uh, enforcement efforts for agencies that are very low funded. Um, if they see a trend over a period of years of one company consistently having a gap, um, that might then kind of spur them to look deeper and see whether those are actually lawful or not, or not lawful. Jim. Can you give us an update on Rizzo? First, I saw that Judge sure. Bea replaced Judge Reinhardt. Are they going to re-argue the case? And two, what happened to the attempts to get the U.S. Supreme Court to take cert on the issue of the different views about apartment? Sure. So the question was about the Rizzo v. Ovino case. Um, so just for anyone who's not familiar with it, that case has to do with the question of prior salary and whether an employer can rely on prior salary to justify a wage disparity uh, under the Federal Equal Pay Act. And in that case, the question was just, is just, whether prior salary can be the only 
defense. In all the other cases that I've seen in the, the circuit courts that Jessica mentioned, uh, prior, the only holdings have been with regard to prior salary as one of many factors. And so in this case, the uh, Ninth Circuit held, um, uh, Ryan Hart's last opinion, uh, that the uh, Federal Equal Pay Act prohibits using prior salary not only alone, but even with other factors as a defense under the Federal Equal Pay Act. Um, the employer in that case petitioned for cert to the U.S. Supreme Court, and as Jessica mentioned, the Supreme Court vacated that judgment, remanded to the Ninth Circuit on procedural grounds. Um, and so, as Jim just mentioned, um, Reinhardt is now dead, and the, the court has drawn, uh, well, Judge Bay has been drawn to replace him on that panel. Unclear what will happen. There is no kind of set procedural rule. Um, so the people I've spoken with do not think there will be a new argument, but we're waiting to hear whether there will be. So most people that I've talked to about this think that he will simply watch the videos of the oral argument, read the underlying papers, and um, and vote. And just this may be more detailed than I, I argued on behalf of making that case, so I know a little bit about the details about this. But the you know Reinhardt's uh, majority opinion was six, and then the remaining five judges of the en banc panels um, kind of were in three different concurring opinions. So Bea could go with the remaining five, which we all hope, um, and hold that prior salary can't be used at all to justify a wage disparity, uh, or he may probably join the, the concurring judges and, and form a new majority. Um, and I think they would just narrowly hold that prior salary can't be the only factor relied upon um, to justify a wage disparity. That's what I think. Yes. Jessica, um, thank you. This question might be for one of your panelists who's on the uh, task force, the Equal Pay Task Force, but uh, maybe this is something that uh, people already know about. But I was curious if the task force, if there's any discussion of um, some sort of rule that would allow employees, not just applicants, to uh, be required to receive a salary range for their current job on a reasonable request. Is that something that's been discussed on? Uh, um, yeah, that's been discussed. And I, I do believe California law does does require um, employers, well, let me, let me check. It's right here. Um, the law does require employers to provide the pay scale of a position um, if an applicant makes a reasonable request. It doesn't go so far as to say that if an employee makes a reasonable request. Um, I haven't come across issues where employees, employers have refused to provide an employee their salary range. I'm not aware of that. Um, but I, I, that, talking over myself a little bit, uh, the law does not provide for it. It did not come up in the task force. The task force was limited to the Fair Pay Act. And so um, this law came about a little bit after we had kind of concluded the substantive discussions on the guidance that we were going to provide. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but I'm not sure if I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I just want to emphasize the importance of pay transparency and how delighted I am to see that states are taking up that issue on a legislative basis and also to remind us of Lily Ledbetter's story and how she worked for Goodyear for 19 years as a floor manager and she did not know she was making less than her two male counterparts until somebody slipped her an anonymous note. Now, her lawsuit eventually failed. Um, the, 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 the courts decided that she should have brought the case 19 years ago when the compensation decision was first made, which of course was absurd because she did not know that she had been harmed at that time. And that also the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act um, happens to be the first bill that Barack Obama signed when he became president. Um, and Lily Ledbetter spoke uh, at the Democratic National Convention a few years ago, and her speech is short but brilliant. If you're interested in this topic, check it out. And she reminded us that when you're paid less every hour of every day of every year, it is a debt that cannot be repaid in dollars and cents alone. And I thought it was such a poetic way of putting it. Um, and significantly, you know, we're, we're, we, talk, we have been talking a lot about base pay, and Jessica reminded us, of course, we've got to look at commissions and bonuses and raises and all of that stuff. And it's so true because it compounds every month, every year. And um, Lynn Coates, for example, she was making almost half of what her male counterpart was making. That was in base pay. 
and farmer's bonus system, which if you looked at it structurally, oh, well, that seems fair, but if women are always at the lower end of the pay band, and women are always found, you know, lower down in the structure, their, her bonuses were dramatically <coughs> less than his, because the bonus formula was based, in large part, on the base pay. So he starts off on third base, and then gets a home run. Um, I wanted to mention two other quick things. Lynn Coates is now a plaintiff's attorney, <laughs> and so is uh, Gian Hook is now also a plaintiff's attorney. Um, I have taken great joy in representing defense attorneys in their equal pay cases, but it gives me a special pleasure to see them come over to the plaintiff's bar. That's <laughs> just good. Um, All right. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to mention was the Economic Policy Institute has an excellent primer on equal pay um, issues, and it's called What is the Gender Pay Gap and Is It Real? And it's about 25 pages long. It's absolutely fascinating. I used to find myself fumbling at cocktail parties to explain the difference between the adjusted wage gap and the raw wage gap. I now have that down pat. I can do that even after a few drinks. Um, but it also dispels a bunch of myths. Like the, the gender pay gap is narrowing, but that is in part because men's wages have stagnated over the last 20 years. And that's something that as society we need to acknowledge, not ignore, not pretend like it's something different, because um, um, that kind of stinks too. And then it also explains that as women get higher educational degrees, the farther you go up the educational ladder, the bigger the gap gets. And that is counterintuitive as well. So there's more to learn for all of us, even experts in the room, and that's a, a document that I had appreciated reading and sometimes go back to. Thanks. Thanks, and on that note, the materials, um, I think some of you got them via email. They're also available at the ABA mid annual and mid-year meeting app. If you don't like apps or can't handle dealing with an app, which I often can't, you can just email me. We'll put our emails up actually here. So you can also just email me and I'll send you the materials which include the, that, that article as well as a lot of other articles that are helpful. Um, any other questions? I have a question for Fred. Fred, what I heard you say regarding these equal pay cases is that you really do need a monitor to make sure that employers are continuing to narrow this pay gap um, among their employees. But if a case is tried, they often take a long time. D does the court normally require a monitor to look at what has happened over the period of time it's taken, the case to finally be resolved, even if it isn't settled? I, I don't think I've ever uh, seen a, a court order that ordered that. I mean, maybe, maybe Jim or uh, Jim has. I don't know if Kelly's still here. but. Um, so I haven't seen a court order that. I don't know if that's in the remedial arsenal of a court order, or, or, or if it is, whether it's used normally. Um, I also didn't mean to say that you have to have a monitor. I, I, uh, I, what I meant to say, or what I intend to say, was it's often a good way to resolve a debate that, over who should monitor it, is to bring in somebody that's trustworthy who can actually do it. But sometimes the parties agree that they can monitor each other, or they trust one side or the other to do it. Uh, so I think it's becoming more popular because I think there's, it helps resolve a lot of issues, but it, it's not required. So I guess my bigger question in these cases, should we be having the plaintiff's attorney require a monitor as a part of the, the resolution of the case? Well, you should probably ask Jim or Kelly that because uh, I think they, they tend to. I think it's good practice to have a monitor. And a lot of judges, judges have discretion to appoint monitors. So, for example, in the Northern District, Judge Henderson appointed a monitor over the Oakland police. For many years, there were monitors over California prisons cases. So I think monitors can be very, perform very useful functions of collecting information, getting the parties to focus, making sure everybody's accountable. Kelly, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, if the case involves more than money, then you have to have someone that ensures accountability to so, especially if the change requires a lot of people coming together to figure out what the 